Good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the March Soils Network of Knowledge webinar, which is the first one for this year. This month we're really lucky to have not one but two presenters and I'd like to introduce them. First up this morning we'll have uh, Belinda Hackney who works for the LLS and she's had 20 years experience in pasture research and, ex and a, um, was an extension agronomist with New South Wales DPI and has worked with the Graham Centre at Charles Sturt University before working with the LLS. And for the past 15 years, she's focused heavily on pasture legume agronomy. And then all after Belinda, we'll have Susan Orgel, who is a researcher from New South Wales DPI. And she's been here since 2005 and worked on a range of soil health projects. And since 2012, um, her work has focused on management strategies to increase soil carbon. Okay, thanks Abby. Um, yeah, so look, this is a good opportunity to um, have a look at something that's often uh, a little bit forgotten or at best assumed and that is that um, we tend to make an assumption that because legumes are growing they're fixing nitrogen and that may not necessarily be the case. So the picture that you can see uh, on the front page here is a Bicerula plant that's showing exceptionally good nodulation and that's that's the goal that you want to achieve, um, a nice healthy plant above ground but more importantly with the role of legumes is to have that healthy nodulation below ground and pumping a lot of nitrogen in either for your following crop rotation or for non-legume components of that pasture. So today we want to have a look at really a couple of key areas um, and, and think about how we could um, maximise nitrogen fixation. So generally if a legume is functioning well it'll fix somewhere around 20 to 30 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of dry matter that it produces but that's not a given. In order to do that it's got to be well nodulated and you've got to have the right strain of rhizobia um, in there. So to, you know, as a starting point to have a look at whether, whether you're anywhere near achieving those goals, first thing you need to do is have a look at the roots um, and then you need to look at whether, the nod whether you have nodules present, and how many they are, what colour they are, how healthy they look and those sort of things. If there are issues around root health or um, nodule number, then one of the things that you really need to have a close look at are soil constraints because um, they can have a huge impact on the kind of nodulation that you get. And other management factors can also affect nodulation and we'll touch briefly on those. We don't have enough time to go into detail for them today. So if you've had a look um, at what's happening with the roots uh, and you've identified what's happening in terms of nodulation and if there's an issue there then you may have to look at um, amelioration tactics uh, particularly around soil chemistry. There's also a role for re-inoculation, um, however re-inoculation in the absence of addressing any soil issues that you have uh, is not going to be particularly long lasting. And then you also have to look at um, pro-legume management. So some of the things that we do in our everyday management of pastures can actually adversely affect nodulation. So this is, um, what I'm going to talk about today is the central west area which I work in but uh, I wanted to, to start off by saying that this whole survey process was kicked off by Janelle Jenkins who works for Riverina LLS. Um, Janelle was quite interested in in looking at some of the reasons for um, poorer performance in, in uh, sub-clover pastures. At the time and, and currently still going, we have an MLA AWI funded project and part of that project was to um, develop a new rapid throughput method of identifying um, strains of rhizobia and that's been developed by Sophie DeMeyer at um, Murdoch University and is now a commercial uh, viability. So it was a very opportune way to collect uh, a lot of nodules for the development of Sophie's new um, MALDID process but it also fitted well uh, in terms of looking at general pasture health. So uh, in this survey um, I did 60 paddocks through the central west area, um, Janelle did 80 through the Riverina uh, and since then there's also been surveys done by Claire Edwards in the central tablelands and Joe Powell's down on the Monaro. So if we think about the central west area uh, for a start, basically um, what I did up there through contact with uh, commercial agronomists uh, and also through farming system groups, um, we identified people who were willing to have us come onto their place and um, actually sample paddocks. So 
it ended up pretty much being three transects. The first one was in the in the northern part of the area, which went from just west of Ningen through to about Baldry. Um, the second one started at Lake Kajelico and went through to Yagara, and the third one started about Ungary and went through to Greenthorpe. Now, in terms of the impact that uh, soil constraints may be having on nodulation and root growth, the picture on your screen now, if you have a look on the left-hand side, um, pretty healthy root systems there. So you've got a good strong taproot on these subclover plants and you've got nice laterals coming off them, uh, good root hairs um, and you know, pretty positive situation. There's also uh, some nodules um, throughout that root system. And what you're seeing over on the right is a much poorer situation where you've, you know, you've had uh, pruning of those root hairs, um, less nodulation, less vigorous above ground growth with those. But in isolated instances where if you walk into a paddock that looks wholly like the plants on the left or wholly like the plants on the right, it can sometimes be difficult to actually identify that you may have a problem below ground. So the, the system that we used when we got into the paddock was to identify a representative area of the paddock that was about 20 metres by 20 metres square and then within that area um, extract uh, 15, a minimum of 15 plants, wash the roots out and have a look at nodules. The nodule scoring system that we used was developed by Ron Yates and his colleagues um, at Dafur and Murdoch um, and in that system the scoring runs from 0 to 8 with a score of 4 considered adequate. So that's what we tended to be looking at there. In terms of nodules, we also had a look at uh, what the insides of the nodules look like and we were sampling generally in late, um, late winter or early spring uh, and where we had good healthy nodules we tended to get these nice sort of pink colours. Now as the nodule gets older and you get more towards the end of the growing season they look more like the picture on the left of your screen where they actually start to break down. If you have these white nodules over here um, they're not effectively fixing nitrogen so if you start to see that um, that's also an issue as well. In terms of the nodulation scores um, this is for the central west so what we found there was 90% of paddocks that, that I sampled had a less than adequate nodulation score and more disturbingly over here we had 20% that had no nodules at all. So it's, it's sort of a, a fairly big issue um, that is often a bit of a sleeper issue um, in these paddocks in that potentially we're not getting the nitrogen fixation out of them that we would like and the photo over on the left shows a fairly typical photo of a plant um, that's been extracted from these less than adequate paddocks. So you can see a bit of a miserable plant above ground but in a whole population of these plants you may not necessarily suspect that there is a problem. If you see isolated patches that's a different thing but quite frequently we were finding these paddocks where the whole paddock above ground looked like that. So you know it was a case of is it a problem or is it some other thing that's going on but when you dug them up it became quite apparent that there was issues with the root system. Over on the right hand side you can see a plant there that's at the other end of the spectrum. So this is one of Janelle's um, that she dug up in the Riverina. Beautiful healthy plant, really lovely healthy root system and nodulated throughout that root system. And those plants were the exception, we didn't find many of those. In terms of other regions, um, the average nodulation score across all the regions that we've done, uh, which is now I think at around 225 paddocks, average nodulation score was 2. So the problem's fairly universal. Um, we encountered mostly subclovers when we went in. We were going into existing paddocks uh, and it didn't really matter too much with pasture age um, in terms of what we were seeing with nodulation. There was no, no significant trend there. Uh, so it was very much a universal problem in terms of what we were seeing with nodulation. So this is just a brief rundown on Sophie's MALDI-ID technique. Um, so the nodules that we collected, uh, we, we did collect nodules off all these plants and sent them over to Sophie for identification to see what strains of rhizobia were eating them. Uh, and this, this new system basically has the turnaround time that you would have associated with a soil test, so it's pretty quick. Um, and that is now a commercial, a commercial um, success I guess you could say. So it's definitely commercially available uh, and it's really quite a quite an interesting technique and quite a rapid technique to get some sort of an idea of what type of um, 
what type of strain of nodule that you've got in there because it's not just about the nodulation, it's about the actual strain in there because newer strains tend to be more effective than some of the older ones that have been hanging around in the soil for quite a while. So again, this is just from the Central West um, and this is just a distribution of pasture age that we had. So you can see we tended to have a uh, reasonable proportion somewhere around about 35-40% uh, of fairly new pastures in that um, survey uh, and then some older ones as well. In terms of the strains of rhizobia, something to think about is, is um, on the commercial aspect is when these things were available or have been made available. So WU95 and those types of strains are quite old ones. Um, WSM409 was the Group C strain um, that was available from uh, the mid-90s to the mid-2000s and then 1325 came, uh, came into being commercially around about 2006. So we would have expected to see uh, in paddocks that were less than 10 years old, a majority of WSM 1325 in any of the trifolium um, annual clover paddocks. But what we actually did see was, regardless of pasture age, uh, using Sophie's technique, was a predominance of 1325. So it, it turned up. 1325 or something that looked very similar to it um, was turning up in about 70% of the pastures that we sampled. So in terms of um, what to look for in a, in a gross kind of way, um, don't assume that above ground appearance is indicative of nodulation status and it can be very difficult if the whole paddock is um, you know, looking quite uniform. It can be quite, quite difficult to pick up that there may be a problem underground and certainly that's what, what we found in these surveys was that when you drove into a paddock, it didn't necessarily show up that there was a was a big problem with nodulation, but there certainly was. Nodulation was less than adequate in, in um, the majority of all these paddocks. The other thing to keep in mind is we grow legumes to fix nitrogen, but if they're not fixing it, they're using it. So you want them to actually be um, building that soil pool rather than um, you know using from it as much as possible. In terms of sampling time, in most areas late winter to early spring, if you start to get into the tableland areas it may be an early to mid spring um, kind of time to do it. You need to dig the plants up, extract them quite carefully from the, um, from the soil, uh, wash the roots out, definitely don't pull the, pull the um, plants up because uh, you can pull a lot of the nodules off. Uh, you want to count and score them and then if you want to go to strain identification you can now do that relatively quickly with the MALDI technique. If there's a nodulation issue then you want to be identifying the cause before proceeding to amelioration because have you not, if you have not done that then um, your, amel your, uh, your correction of that problem won't be as effective. So this is, um, this is a flow chart that Sophie DeMeyer um, developed which is actually quite helpful in terms of deciding how you tackle these problems. So I've pretty much covered this top bit up here where you're looking at the root systems, you're, you're doing some nodule scoring, you're deciding whether those root systems are healthy or not healthy and you're assigning a score to the nodulation that you see on those. Now if you've got healthy roots um, and you've got a good nodulation score, chances are things are pretty good in terms of what those legumes are doing. If you check the roots and you check the nodule score and you've got unhealthy roots and a low nodulation score then you may proceed to um, having a look at what strain of rhizobia that you have in there. If you've got the correct strain um, then it may be a case of looking at what's happening in terms of your soils to boost um, nodulation within those pastures even though if you've got the wrong strain of inoculant then you still need to look at what's happening in terms of soil. So that's particularly things around pH, phosphorus, we need sulphur on that chart, that's um, this little graph, it's not there, we need that on there, molybdenum and aluminium. So um, that's basically where I've covered up to. I'll just have a quick talk around pH and then hand over to Suze. So this is what we found in terms of soil pH. Uh, the line here at 5.5 will start to make a little bit more sense in a minute when we have a look at another chart. Um, but what you can see here is basically three quarters of the paddock, uh, paddocks that were sampled and this was similar again in other regions, in some regions actually more intense than this. About three quarters of the paddocks had a pH that was less than 5.5 in calcium chloride. Uh, and 
actually, I was thinking we had a different slide there. The, in terms of um, uh, pH of 7, um, we had more than 90% of paddocks that had a pH of less than 7. Now the reason for that, I'll just skip that slide and go straight to the next one. The reason for that is quite a lot of the time we think about plant tolerance to pH uh, and it completely ignore rhizobia tolerance. So this is a slide that was put together by um, Ron Yates and um, various colleagues uh, looking at the tolerance of the plant but also the associated rhizobia. So if you remember back to that slide on pH, we had a vertical red line at pH 5.5. So if we look at subclover here in its group C inoculant, the 1325, the current strain, it works optimally at a pH of 5.5 to 7 but the plant will grow quite comfortably down to a pH of, um, of around about 4.8. But you can see the lower pH of 5, you start to get into suboptimal and very low um, nitrogen fixation areas in terms of the ability of that rhizobia to perform its function. So that's why that's so critically important. A lot of the time we're wanting, to, we're wanting these legume plants to grow optimally in suboptimal conditions and for that rhizobia to survive often in very suboptimal conditions. You can see there with other plants you have different tolerances and you also have different tolerances with the associated rhizobia. The interesting one down here is lucerne um, in that the plant, we commonly see lucerne growing quite happily at pH of 5.5 uh, but if you have a look at the um, requirements for the um, rhizobia you can see that it, it's optimally functioning at a pH of 7 and above. So there's quite a discrepancy there in terms of plant tolerance and rhizobia tolerance and I think that's a big thing that we really don't give enough consideration to. So anyway, I'll stop there and hand over to Suze uh, and let her go. All right, good morning everyone. So I guess another reason that we consider soil pH is the influence it has on nutrient availability and also nutrient toxicity. So now I'm going to briefly talk about um, three key aspects that we look at in soil tests, um, the aluminium percentage, uh, soil phosphorus and soil sulphur. So first of all, aluminium percentage. So despite the low pH values in the Central West Survey, aluminium was generally not necessarily an issue. And I guess there's um, a couple of key reasons for that. Uh, first of all, we have to think about where aluminium comes from in the soil. So just because the soil uh, is acidic, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the aluminium is going to come into solution if it's got a low clay content or if the type of clays in the soil perhaps aren't high in those aluminium hydroxides, which is where the aluminium comes from. But as a general rule, uh, as soon as we start to look at low soil pHs, we start to see an increase in uh, aluminium percentage. So this graph here that I'm going to show you is um, data collected from over a thousand sorry, over 5,000 paddocks from the Healthy Soils for Healthy Landscapes project. And I've just put it in this presentation as an example of the trends and relationships between soil pH and aluminium percentage. So on this graph, on the x-axis, we have our pH in calcium chloride going from 3 to 8. Obviously, the scale goes up to 14, but for the purpose of this um, demonstration, we've just gone up to 8. And on the y-axis, we've got aluminium percentage going from 0% up to 80%. And that's kind of where you'd start to see aluminium cans popping out of the ground. Uh, we've got two colours that you'll see here, um, pink for cropping and blue for grazing. So if we look at the data, we can see um, as uh, the soil pH decreases, remembering that pH is measured on a log scale, so a pH of 5 is 10 times as acidic as a pH of 6, and it's 100 times as acidic as a pH of 7. As the pH decreases, we can see an increase in the availability of aluminium. When we lime a soil, so perhaps we're liming from a soil a pH of 4 to a soil pH of 5, the aluminium stays in the soil, it's just less available to plants. So we can see the cropping and the grazing data plotted there. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, key reasons we look at this is, as Belinda said, above a certain pH, most plants won't be affected by um, aluminium toxicity, and below a certain pH, and the, the rule of thumb usually is about 4.6, but it can kind of vary as we can see as it gets more acidic aluminium becomes more into solution, um, plants might be affected by aluminium toxicity. And I guess now is an important time to talk about the fact that what we see above ground isn't always representative of below ground and also it's, you've got to take into account the pasture age. So some of these higher aluminium toxicity, sorry, 
high aluminium percentage pasture sites here from this particular project were up around Tumbarumba and they were growing in quite healthy Phalera stands because um, the Phalaris was already established um, before the acidification process happened and the aluminium um, toxicity had set in. So why do we look at aluminium? As I said, it's harm, as Belinda said, it's harmful to roots as well as rhizobia, um, particularly once we get below a pH of around that 4.8 or 5 in calcium chloride. Now often it's rhizobia that are more sensitive to aluminium toxicity than the actual host plants, um, so it's important to consider the graph that, um, that Belinda presented in the pre previous slide when interpreting these soil test results as well. It's also important to remember the importance of soil organic carbon as soils with <clears throat> a high organic carbon percentage uh, can actually absorb soluble um, aluminium so it can mean that it's less damaging to plants and rhizobia um, in the soil as well. But if we think about where organic carbon is distributed in the soil profile, this is generally concentrated in the surface soil layers so we might have aluminium toxicity um, effects lower down in the soil profile. Uh, now we're looking at exactly the same data from the previous graph but looking at it spatially and this is looking at the 0 to 10 centimetre um, aluminium concentration from that Healthy Soils for Healthy Landscapes project. Um, you might not be able to see because it's in font size 2 but basically if it's blue um, that's looking at an aluminium percentage of less than 10 and then green through to red is looking from 10 to over 50% aluminium. Now in this first circle here, this is where Belinda's um, Central West uh, transects were and we can see um, based on these colours that it closely aligns with what Belinda was saying in terms of aluminium wasn't necessarily um, an issue uh, apart from in the occasional uh, situation. If we have a look down here through the tablelands though where we've got a lot of permanent pastures um, which have a leguminous component which are reliant on that nitrogen fixation from the legume, we can see that we've got some quite high aluminium concentrations that would align with quite acidic soils. So we've got the three ca uh, catchments here just for a bit of context. So down here we have the ACT and we've got the upper and lower Murrumbidgee, um, the Murray catchment and the Lachlan catchment up here. If we look at the next layer of soil down, so looking at the 10 to 20 centimetre layer, um, again you've got the same circles here, we can see that we've got quite a bit of subsoil or 10 to 20 centimetre soil um, acidity and aluminium problems through this permanent pasture zone as well. So that's just an example of I guess uh, where we'd start to look at perhaps plant and rhizobia effects um, from aluminium concentration. If we have a look at what that might look like in a soil profile, so this is a duplex soil, so we've got our A1 horizon, A2 horizon and our B2 horizon. Um, if we think about what the pH organic carbon and aluminium concentration profile might look like in a, in a profile, this particular example has a pH in calcium chloride of 5.2, so an aluminium percentage of um, about 1% in the top soil and it's got high organic carbon as well, so it would be absorbing that soluble um, aluminium concentration as well. Um, as soon as we move down into this next soil layer though, the A2 horizon, which is bleached and leached, we can see that our soil pH drops um, as does our organic carbon concentration which isn't surprising and we get an increase in our aluminium percentage. So if we're thinking about this as our environment for our plant roots to search for and get nutrients and for our rhizobia to survive, we can see that um, it's probably going to be quite important to look at subsoil acidity as well. So now moving on to our next big nutrient which is phosphorus. Now on this graph here on the x-axis we've got the available phosphorus in COA <coughs> and um, we've got our, the distribution of data from the Central West Transect Surveys. As you can see we um, perhaps phosphorus wasn't as alarming as what we're going to show you in the next slide for sulphur, but about, about 40 percent of the paddocks were less than the uh, COA P of 29 or 30. We've got some quite high values because a lot of these pastures were in phase farm systems so they're coming out of a cropping rotation so we've got some high coal P values and we've also got some very low coal P values as well. So if we think about what phosphorus is important for, so it's really important for root growth and that's going to be particularly important early on in the pasture establishment establishment phase and from a planned process point of view phosphorus is essential for photosynthesis and um, supplying sugars for bacterial growth and also phosphorus in that transformation process which goes on within the root nodule going from a um, from nitrogen gas into uh, ammonia. 
So um, if we think about the role of phosphorus in terms of uh, uh, adequate phosphorus, if we've got adequate phosphorus in the soil, we kind of facilitate a timely development of nodules so that they're active and fixing nitrogen for longer while the legumes are growing. And we also have a higher density of rhizobia in the soil surrounding the roots, which is obviously really important because the plants are pumping out those really important sugars, which attracts microbes close to the root systems. Um, so we can see that it's important to keep an eye on phosphorus and in this case here um, some paddocks were of particular concern but there were certainly paddocks with adequate or higher than adequate phosphorus levels. I guess another important point here is that we need to consider phosphorus in terms of the phosphorus buffering index as well and for these particular paddocks most were in the very low or low category so that's why we've got this particular line here as a kind of rough rule of thumb. If we now move on to sulphur, however, sulphur is another really important nutrient when we're thinking about nitrogen fixation and legume growth. Um, again, on the x-axis here, we've got available sulphur measured using the KCL40 method, um, and we've got the distribution of the paddock data. And if we assume that we um, think that uh, Available phosphor, uh, sorry, available sulphur level of eight is adequate. Ninety-four percent of the paddocks from the Central West surveys um, had inadequate sulphur levels. So we can see that this could definitely be limiting um, nodulation as well as root growth and nitrogen fixation. Um, when we're thinking about sulphur in soil, 95% of it actually comes from this an organic pool and of, of sulphur, so it's highly um, correlated with organic matter mineralization and organic carbon levels. Sulphur is really important for the formation of chlorophyll, so the plant can photosynthesize uh, proteins, amino acids and enzymes, so it's obviously a determinant of plant growth and root exploration as well. It also improves sugar supply, so again, the energy supply for bacterial growth, uh, and it's an essential component of the um, enzyme in which nitrogen kind of transforms, in, transforms from a gaseous form into a plant available form. So if we think about phosphorus, sulfur, and also molybdenum, and molybdenum was mentioned earlier when Belinda was talking about the different colored root nodules and how it's important to have um, to to excavate the plants and have a look at the colour of the root nodules. Um, so a uh, pink nodule means that you've got lots of leg hemoglobin, which is the molybdenum components of um, hemoglobin, gives it that nice red colour, which is just like blood hemoglobin, but it's got a leg in the front, like legume. Um, so it's a really important component and it means that that fixation process is actually occurring. And it also means that we've got oxygen, well, an oxygen regulated environment within the nodule so that that nitrogen fixation process can happen. So they're all required for this fixation pro um, process and they're important components of the enzymes um, and ingredients that are required um, to fix nitrogen in paddocks. Uh, they're also important for energy storage and transformation, in particular phosphorus, and that's another reason why it's important to have adequate available phosphorus levels in your soil. And we also know that both phosphorus, sulfur and aluminium are less available if you've got a really low soil pH as well. And this again is something we can manage. Uh, molybdenum measurements in terms of soil um, can be quite tricky and it's not as commercially available and it's not as sensitive perhaps as um, to reflect what's actually required in the soil. So generally what we can do is uh, monitor the colour of the root nodules and make sure that we're applying a molybdenum based product every three to four years if you're in an acidic soil. I guess overall the point of this presentation is to say that we need to under, uh, address the underlying issue if we want to get maximum benefit out of our um, legumes which are in, in the system. So for example where we're looking at phosphorus in some of the um, central west data, a lot of that phosphorus um, when you look at the landholder survey information was left over from the cropping phase and if the purpose of the legume in that phase is to build up nitrogen then it's perhaps not desirable to be using leftover phosphorus, it should be actually maintaining a high level of phosphorus or adequate level of phosphorus so that that nitrogen fixation can occur and then when you go back into the cropping phase you've got access to a significant or considerable nitrogen bank. Now say you've looked at your plants, you've looked at the roots and you've looked at the nodules and you've got your soil chemistry results. Um, if the nodulation status is poor but you've got good soil chemistry, so you've got adequate soil environment for both the legume to survive and the rhizobia to survive, then you could look at uh, re-inoculation. 
If you've got poor nodulation status and you've got some soil chemistry issues, then if you just purely go in and inoculate, then you might have a short-term impact, um, but you're obviously going to have uh, long-term implications and restrictions and limitations on rhizobia survival, so it's ideal to be looking at addressing those underlying soil constraints. So I guess basically it comes back to basic agronomy, looking at maintaining an adequate soil pH, um, applying phosphorus if the levels are inadequate so that you can maximise both plant growth, growth as well as uh, nitrogen fixation process through those critical um, uh, transformation processes. Apply sulphur if the levels are low and I think um, that was perhaps the most alarming result from this particular survey but it's not restricted to this survey because it's quite common to have um, low sulphur levels if it's not being maintained, particularly if our higher analysis fertilizer, phosphorus fertilisers have been used um, in preference um, in recent times. Apply molybdenum based fertiliser every th three to four years, particularly on acidic soils and I guess another important consideration that we didn't necessarily Necessarily talk about in this um, in this presentation is the uh, to be aware of residue, uh, herbicide residues and plant back periods. So. Then I guess the obvious question is, we know all this, like we're not telling you something new in terms of liming soils and making sure you've got adequate phosphorus and sulphur and molybdenum, then the question becomes perhaps why haven't we got this right and what are we missing and that's perhaps more food for thought than me enlightening you on that answer. <laughs> So again, going through a summary, um, and I hope that people find this really useful because I, I found this useful that Belinda and her team put together in the steps looking at integrating, I guess, both looking at what's happening above and below ground, actually looking at the nodules, making some decisions, and up until here, this is all free and you're doing it in the field, then perhaps if there is a concern, having a look at what the rhizobia actually are and then making some soil-based or management-based decisions uh, to increase nitrogen fixation on farms. Three important things that we haven't covered today that we'd like to highlight as considerations are the effect of residual herbicides on rhizobia survival, um, rhizobia delivery mechanisms, and also it's very important, obviously, with any farm management decision to consider the economics of the decisions and looking at perhaps manip manipulating the current system versus renovating the current system as well. A very important reference um, for anything to do with inoculating legumes and legume growth and modulation is this very useful publication, so we'd like to acknowledge that. And with that, we'll finish on our key messages, which largely revolve around the importance of monitoring, measuring, and making smart decisions on farms about nitrogen fixation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda and Susan. I think that was um, great. Lots of really good information. And as I said, everyone, now's your opportunity to ask any questions that you would like of both um, Belinda and Susan. And we've got one already that um, relates to the Maldi work, uh, Belinda. And uh, Gavin Peck wanted to know how broad, how many different legumes, I think. He says, does Maldi work with rhizobia for other legumes or is it just a few? That's his question. Yeah, look, I think um, you'd have to get the full detail from Sophie on that one. But certainly, um, she's had a, a very wide range of um, annual legumes through that, uh, and particularly annual trifoliums, but also uh, bicerulas and cerradellas. Um, so some of the other ones you'd have to um, get more detail from her on that. But like anything, it's a critical um, amount uh, that you need in terms of um, you know getting a, uh, I suppose, a calibration on those new techniques. Uh, so you just have to contact Sophie to get a bit more information on that one. Okay, thanks very much, Belinda. Now I've got a few more questions coming in, which is great. Lisa Lobby de Bruins asked how many plants you'd have to sample to to be sure that there was an issue. So what's your your representative sample size? Yeah, well, look, in talking, we, we spent a lot of time in planning this with both um, Sophie DeMeyer and also Ron Yates. Um, and they're, based on what they had done in Western Australia, they've also done you know quite a bit of extensive work over there in terms of in paddock sampling. Uh, it was somewhere around that sort of 15 to 20 plants would 
in that type of area will, will generally give you a good um, representative sample. Now obviously more is better um, but there's a trade-off between the amount of time you have to spend in the paddock and um, you know getting getting good robust results but that seems to be around that 15 to 20 mark seems to give you um, pretty representative samples. Great, thank you. That's really useful information. There's quite a few questions about the cost of the MALDI test? Again, contact Sophie for that, but you're not looking at anything more than you would be looking at for a, um, a, a you know, a, a soil test basically. So it depends on the number of samples being sent uh, and that kind of thing. The other thing is the window for sampling is it's not going to be until, you know, late winter, early spring in most areas. So definitely talk to Sophie before you go out to do that. Kim Billingham has a, a question about the flow chart. If she wanted to know what the SU at the bottom of that um, chart is referring to. So that's referring to sulfonyl ureas and what we might do is just flick through to the last slide Sue's put up. Um, so they're things, um, you know, trisulfuron is one of those, chlorsulfuron, metsulfuron, methyl, those kind of things, they're within that um, group of herbicides. So this is some work that Ron Yates and um, his colleagues did at DAFWA. Uh, looking at um, the effect of different levels of residue of SUs and their effect on uh, root growth and nodulation. And the effect that um, the SUs tend to have is on stripping root hairs off the plant and root hairs are the mechanism by which you get the signalling for the rhizobia to come in uh, to cause nodulation. So what you can see when you look at this picture is you've got a control over here and then you've got different levels of residue, so going from one one hundred thousandth of the recommended rate, so recommended rate with trisulfurons 30 grams, so they've just simulated different residue levels, uh, up to one tenth of the recommended rate. And you can see here on your control you've got a nice healthy root system, you've got good laterals coming off it and these are 18 day old plants and you can see that you've already got nodulation here around the crown. So the earlier you can get nodulation uh, and effective nodulation, the amount of nitrogen you fix is then just directly related to how much that plant grows. So you can see here, even at one one hundred thousandth of the recommended rate, the root system still looks pretty healthy, above ground still looks pretty healthy, but you've got no nodules and as you go further to the left, the situation just gets worse. So we did encounter this um, and what you tend to see is you get these glassy roots, you've got an absence of root hairs, we do have root hairs, it can look a lot like aluminium toxicity, so they're short and they're thick and they don't tend to hold um, soil very well. Um, so it's really something that we need to be aware of that and uh, clopyrrolid, um, which is the active ingredient in lontrol is also um, quite serious um, in terms of its effect on, on nodulation as well. There's um, a quick little assay that you can do um, and we don't have a photo of that here but it's another one that Ron and his colleagues have done as well is that there is an SU tolerant medic called Angel uh, which was developed in South Australia and um, you can actually, the, the easiest way to do this is, is if you suspect you have a problem, um, get some soil, get your legume that you want to grow but also get some Angel, plant them in there uh, and within a couple of weeks you'll know whether you've got a problem or not because the angel will grow quite effectively through um, you know, a sulfonyl urea residue. Mm -hmm. Now don't gallop out and all grow angel because it has, it has restrictions in terms of the type of soil, the pH requirements it has and those sorts of things. So, but the area where people tend to get most caught out with, with SUs is where they've used a summer spray. So they've put a little bit of an issue in the tank if they're chasing something like melons or something like that. And an uh, a emerging problem on the tablelands is people are using this within the growing season to control off, you know, control things like Patterson's Curse. Mm -hmm. So bad enough that you have it, you know, 12 months ahead of when you put the legume in. But if you're doing it within the growing season, you just you, you're just setting yourself up for a big mess. So. Um, that it's all this information is on the labels. Um, we're often not very good at reading labels. Uh, so if you observe plant back periods, that you minimise the, the chance of having an issue. Sonia Lee has asked about um, residual herbicide stuff. What are the most problematic ones of those and where would she find more information on that? 
the um, the most comprehensive work that I that I know of anyway is the work that has been done at Daffer and Murdoch with Ron Yates and his colleagues, uh, and they've also done screening on you know probably the widest range of herbicides, but also the the associated legumes. So um, some of that is is available, um, and some is still in write up phase as well. So uh, that's where I'd suggest that you look for pasture legume uh, information. That would be where I'd look. And is most of that just uh, still scientific papers, or are there are there other publications that you're aware uh, of? I'd have to. Have, I think there have there has been um, some things in GRDC updates. I'm not sure. I'd have to check on whether they've got to journal publication yet or not. But there's actually, you know, there's work done on this in the 80s by different people. So it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's a little bit like the rhizobia tolerance thing to pH. We've just kind of, you know, ignorance is bliss, and we've chosen to ignore it to some extent and hope that it goes away. But yeah, so look through some of the historic literature because there is references to it, you know, back in the eighties and that kind of thing as well. Okay, thank you for that. Lisa Lobby de Bruins asked about what's your first thing that you would do? Why wouldn't you just me measure soil pH first or, or do you need to check rhizobia as well? Well, I think I think the thing with that flowchart, um, and Sue's explained it really well, was the top bit of that's free. Um, so mm -hmm. it's it's very easy to, I mean, if you have soil tests currently, um, that can give you an indication of where you are. Like by all means, you use them, but the ultimate test is is that legume nodulating or not, and are the nodules healthy? Um, so that's the first. You know that's that's the first step you have to have a look at uh, in terms of um, actually are those legumes likely to be able to reach their potential. So nothing wrong with looking at a pH test if you have it, but I'd always go to the source first in, in, a, in an unknown paddock. It's pretty quick and pretty easy to dig up these plants, wash them off and, and have a look at what's happening yeah, in terms of... Okay, then um, Sonia Lee's also asked another question. She's asked if the, um, if the later strains are more effective than older strains. Would you like to comment on that, Linda? Yeah. So look, yes, they are. There's, um, if we had had more time, we, we've got a lovely picture from um, John Howison that shows the uh, the sort of, I suppose, evolving of the Group C strain of Rhizobia um, and its host, also its host tolerance and how that's expanded over time. So WU95 that was around in the I think from the 60s, Ford, um, worked quite well with subclover. Um, and then they went to uh, the one that was available from the mid-90s um, mid through to the mid-2000s. It had a broader host range. So it became important when, um, when there started to be a range of uh, other annual legumes come into, uh, onto the market to make sure uh, that they would actually nodulate efficiently. And some of them didn't nodulate particularly well with older strains of Group C. So the 1325 strain that's currently around that um, covers most of your annual legumes um, has a broader host range. Um, it's it, uh, is actually more effective um, under a range of conditions than previous ones and it works across a wider range of species. So yes, um, generally, yeah, newer strains, they only get released because they're better. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, oh, lots more questions have come up. Um, Peter Harrison said that, um, has said Graham Blair identified low uh, soil sulphur as an issue in the Central West Slopes in the late 60s and he wants to know why why it's still such an issue if it's been known about for that long. Who wants to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really good point and when you look back at the literature, we've been talking about phosphorus and in particular sulphur for a very long time and I guess it's often assumed um, by advisors and some producers that if it's not available in the topsoil perhaps it's available to plants deeper down and that the reason for that is that sulfurs are soluble in the soil solutions so it can wash down through the soil profile and I guess that's true um, but I, you need to think about it in context of a new growing plant and having sulphur perhaps down at 20 or 30 centimetres when you're a seed that's germinating in the topsoil isn't going to necessarily be helpful and if we look at the 
um, the image on the screen at the moment of the 18 days growth. So within 18 days, we've got um, uh, a plant that's nodulating and rhizobia forming, I guess, and starting to fix nitrogen. And in this particular case, this plant would have needed sulfur to be in that topsoil. So I'm not sure why it's still an issue, but I certainly do still get told that it doesn't matter if you don't have it in the topsoil because it's deeper down. And I guess I'm always saying, well, plants that don't have root systems yet can't really access sulfur that's deeper down. So we need to be thinking about actually managing it in the surface soil as well. But it's not the first time that's been said as well. <laughs> okay, thanks, Susan. I will read out a question from Scott Woods. So Scott has said, is the 20 to 30 kilograms of nitrogen fixation from legumes purely from underground or do we need some above ground plant breakdown as well? Hence grazing or cutting reduces potential supply from legumes. Who'd like to? Yeah, um, look, this. Um, I'll have a go if you like. <laughs> so look, generally, um, generally, yes, that twenty, the twenty to thirty kilo, kilograms of nitrogen is um, just it's based on above ground growth. So it's like that's how much it's fixing. Now, if you work at West Australians, rated at um, you know, three to three and a half percent of the total plant is nitrogen. So they work it on the same kind of thing. If you actually sit down and do the sums, it's a similar kind of metric that you're using. But yeah, don't get too confused on that. Um, it's The important thing is if they're functioning well, they will fix between 20, even up to 40 sometimes, kilograms of nitrogen per tonne of dry matter they produce above ground. So it's it's still talking about the fixing um, and that's that's the important bit. So it's, it's the amount that's fixed. It's just in New South Wales, we tend to talk, it's just an easy metric to, me to measure what's above ground. Whereas in WA, sometimes they talk about the whole plant uh, but if you sit down and work it out, it actually comes out about the same. Great. Thanks, Belinda. Um, Joe uh, Powells has um, made a comment rather than a question, so I'll read out what Joe said. She says, there's been a historical push not to consider liming paddocks and just concentrate on addressing key nutrients such as phosphorus and sulphur. And she said, it's time to start considering, considering liming on an equal footing if soil pH is significantly limiting legume performance. So do either of you want to comment on that? I would just comment back, and it is a really important point that Joe's making, and I think for me it, it reminds me of what Belinda said at the start, what you see above ground isn't necessarily reflective of what's happening below ground, and just because you've got a plant that's growing well doesn't necessarily mean that you've got nitrogen fixation happening, and I think perhaps in the past when we've looked at some of our lime trials, we've looked at the effect on pasture production and dry matter production, and, and in the case of nitrogen fixation, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rhizobia surviving, nodulating and fixing uh, nitrogen. And if we have a look at uh, the graph that's on the um, slide, the screen at the moment, too often we just look at plant tolerance and it's really, we need to think about it within the context of this symbiotic relationship with rhizobia. And if it's not fixing nitrogen as well, it's using nitrogen. I think that's a really important point that sometimes gets a bit forgotten actually. Great. Well, I think that's it. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Belinda and Susan once again. It was a really interesting and, um, you know, practical and thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. And um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And we look out for the invitation for next month's uh, webinar. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Belinda.